Imagine this. You need welfare to survive, but you're forced to undergo sterilization just to keep receiving it. Or you visit the doctor for treatment, only to discover later that you were unknowingly part of a medical experiment. When government agencies allow hundreds of people to suffer on purpose and call it healthcare or research, it begs the question, what else might be justified in the name of public health? The cases in this video aren't some wild conspiracy theory. They're documented history, real health policies and medical experiments that the US government not only permitted, but often actively funded. Today, the appointment of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. as head of the Department of Health and Human Services has sparked intense debate. Supporters see him as a much-needed disruptor, someone unafraid to challenge long-standing health policies and demand greater transparency from the institutions that shape them. The pharmaceutical industry is, um, I mean, I don't want to say because this is going to seem extreme that a criminal enterprise so these are the most corrupt companies in the world. And the problem is that they're serial felons. But critics are sounding the alarm. They argue that his history of promoting vaccine misinformation and public health skepticism could seriously undermine trust in healthcare. Regardless of your political beliefs, one thing is clear. His message resonates with a growing number of Americans who are no longer willing to just trust the system. And when you look at history, it's not hard to see why. In 1932, a government-run study began in Tuskegee, Alabama, which involved over 600 black men. Nearly 400 of them had syphilis. They were told that they had bad blood, a vague term used at the time to describe everything from anemia to fatigue. They were promised free health care, but what they actually received was nothing of real value. No cure, no meaningful treatment, just placebos, vitamins, aspirin, saline injections, Enough to create the illusion of care, but not enough to make a difference. Even after penicillin became the standard treatment for syphilis in the 1940s, researchers deliberately withheld it, choosing instead to observe how the disease progressed untreated. They stood by as men went blind, lost their minds, and died, all while pretending to help. And for decades, the U.S. government knew exactly what was happening. Internal memos show that officials raised concerns, but ultimately they chose to protect the study, not the patients. They feared that stopping it would ruin the data. It wasn't until 1972 that the study was finally shut down, not by a medical review board, but by journalist Gene Heller of the Associated Press, whose expose revealed the horrifying truth and sparked national outrage. But by that point, it had gone on for 40 years, four decades of government-sanctioned medical deception, even after a cure was widely available. The fallout led to sweeping reforms in research ethics, Institutional review boards were created to ensure informed consent and prevent abuses like this from ever happening again. But the damage was done, and for many, especially in black communities, the betrayal left a scar that is never fully healed. The practice of eugenics is something most people associate with Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Party. Eugenics is a pseudoscientific racial ideology used to promote the idea of a superior biological race. Think tall, strong white people with blonde hair and blue eyes. For the Nazi regime, it justified mass genocide and the Holocaust. It's a practice so profoundly unethical, one would hope it ended with World War II. But in the United States, it continued quietly for decades. From the 1950s through the 1970s, many state sterilization programs received funding from the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, now known as the Department of Health and Human Services. These programs were used to sterilize thousands of women, often without their informed consent. One of the most notable examples is the case of Mary Alice and Minnie Ralph, two black girls just 12 and 14 years old, who were sterilized in Alabama in 1973. Their mother, who was illiterate, had unknowingly signed a consent form with an ex, thinking her daughters were receiving birth control shots. Instead, they were permanently sterilized. This case put a spotlight on how federal funds had been used to support involuntary sterilizations, especially among poor women and women of color. Some black women were even sterilized as a condition for receiving welfare, a practice so common it became known as the Mississippi appendectomy. On native reservations, women were sterilized without consent through federally funded programs under the Indian Health Service. And in hospitals across the country, some women were pressured into sterilization during or immediately after childbirth. Many were misled, coerced, or not even told what the procedure was. There were no safeguards, no real consent, just a quiet erasure of reproductive rights, carried out in clinics and hospitals, backed by government policy. When lawsuits finally emerged in the 1970s, the HEW defended itself by claiming the women had volunteered, 
despite overwhelming evidence of coercion, deception, and systemic abuse. In the 1950s and 60s, researchers conducted hepatitis experiments on children at Willowbrook State School in New York. Willowbrook was a state-run institution for children with intellectual disabilities, notorious for its overcrowded, unsanitary, and underfunded conditions. It was a place where neglect was the norm, but for some children, the nightmare went even further. Researchers, including Dr. Sal Krugman from New York University, deliberately infected children with hepatitis to study the disease's progression and to test treatments. Parents were often coerced into consenting to these experiments, being told that their children wouldn't be admitted to Willowbrook unless they agreed. According to the researchers, hepatitis was already widespread at Willowbrook because of its appalling conditions. They argued that infecting children intentionally wouldn't make things worse. In reality, they were exploiting one of society's most vulnerable populations. And these experiments weren't the work of a few rogue scientists. They were approved and supported by powerful institutions, from the New York State Department of Mental Hygiene to the Surgeon General's office. Even New York University backed the research. This experiment was just another reminder of how easily vulnerable people can be exploited when scientific ambition outweighs moral responsibility. Imagine going to a hospital for care, only to discover later that doctors had injected you with live cancer cells without your knowledge. It sounds unthinkable, but it happened. In the early 1960s, researchers at the Jewish Chronic Disease Hospital in New York injected live cancer cells into chronically ill patients. Many of these individuals were elderly and had conditions unrelated to cancer. The goal was to study how the human immune system responds to cancer cells. Researchers believed the body would naturally reject the cells and that the injections would be harmless. But here's the really disturbing part. The patients weren't told what was happening. They weren't informed that the cells were cancerous or even that they were part of an experiment. There was no informed consent. Dr. Chester Southam, the virologist who led the experiment, later claimed that disclosing the full details to the patient would have caused them unnecessary fear. So instead, he and his team proceeded with the experiment, treating vulnerable patients as test subjects under the guise of routine care. Its legacy remains a sobering reminder that without proper oversight, even well-intentioned science can drift into deeply unethical territory. In the 1990s, the U.S. government began ramping up funding for abstinence-only sex education. The idea was charmingly simple. Just tell young people not to have sex and hope they listen. The programming began under Title V of the Social Security Act, which provided federal funding to states for teaching sexual risk avoidance. In theory, it was about promoting health. In practice, it often meant skipping over basic facts about reproductive health in favor of a singular message, which was, don't have sex. By the early 2000s, abstinence-only programs were being taught in classrooms across the country. Many of them promoted strict gender stereotypes. For example, that a man is less likely to want to marry a woman who's had sex. Some programs even suggested that premarital sex could lead to long-term emotional harm or instability. In several states, teachers were prohibited from discussing contraception altogether. And the results of the curriculum? Well, it wasn't exactly encouraging. Multiple studies showed that abstinence-only education didn't delay sex, didn't reduce STI rates, and didn't lower teen pregnancy. In fact, by 2006, after years of growing investment in these programs, the United States still had the highest teen pregnancy rate among developed countries. Despite that, the funding didn't stop. In fact, it continues to this day. Two major federal programs are still supporting abstinence-focused education and have poured hundreds of millions of dollars into them, despite a persistent lack of evidence that these programs improve public health outcomes. And as the data shows, the real risk to teens isn't knowledge, it's what happens when we intentionally withhold it. These stories are reminders of how public health systems can fail when ethics take a backseat to ideology. And while many reforms have been made since these incidents came to light, they also serve as cautionary tales, primarily that trust in healthcare must be earned, and history shows us why that's a big pill to swallow.